No pup date today, but we'll be dealing with that later on in the week. I say later on in the week. It's halfway through already, really, isn't it? But we'll get, we'll get some more stuff, you know, maybe Thursday or Friday, something like that. I want to do a little news roundup uh, today. I guess I could have gone with just the story that Nicholas Fulkrug will not be available until after the international break. But I'm not entirely sure I believe it. And I have to say that because, I mean, it would be pretty damn bad news, that's for sure, if it was the case. What does that mean in real money? It means that he wouldn't be back until the 19th of October. I mean, that's that's a long way, isn't it? I mean, bearing in mind he's actually been out for three weeks already. To wait until the 19th is, that's the game against Tottenham. There's an international break now. Um, it would mean he misses the Ipswich game, which is really, really important for, for everybody. Whilst, you know, there's not been a load of speculation about... Hula Lopper take his job this week, and, and rightly so. You know, the, the draw afforded him that that respite, if you want. A loss against Ipswich, and it, I was going to say it all starts again. A loss against Ipswich, and it might even be all over. So it's a crucially important game, and the full Krug, if we're to believe what we've been told is is vitally important to what Lopetegui uh, is trying to do. And, and he has traditionally preferred to use throughout his career a big old lump as a striker. So I, I guess that's believable, whether you believe that it was a Tim Stighton sign-in or, you know, or, or anybody else's. I think it probably was. That's not to say that he wouldn't be of some use to Lopetegui. And I think it's going to... Hopefully it won't be a big miss against Ipswich, but... I mean, Ipswich are nobody's fools, are they, at the moment? I think they've probably performed a little bit better than some anticipated. So anyway, it looks like he's going to be missing. So I think that's that's a pretty big blow, actually, um, for West Ham, particularly given the situation with Mikel Antonio. Now, Mikel Antonio, if you don't know, has actually been basically pimped out for sale over the last week or two, and uh, particularly in the last couple of days, that West Ham are going to be willing to sell him in a January transfer window. I find that a little bit... A little bit odd. Look, it's not Mikel Antonio's fault that he's being asked to play as a first-choice striker for West Ham at the moment, which is what he is. There's no way the club should be in that situation or Antonio. What I wanted and what I thought for Antonio this season really shouldn't have changed at all, and that's impact sub. It, he should be coming off the bench, whatever, for the last half hour of a game uh, and causing absolute mayhem. Ironically, he's looked OK in his last two games. One of them was against Liverpool. Yeah, I know that was an absolute spanking. Uh, Probably the wrong word there. It was an absolute thrashing. <laughs> uh, giving away a bit much there, haven't I, really? Uh, it was absolute thrashing. And then I thought he played OK against Brentford up until the point where he didn't. And he got absolutely cream crackered. He was dead on his feet after an hour. And that's always going to be the case. He said it himself at the start of the season. So I guess we shouldn't be surprised by that. The, the bad thing is he's in that situation. We've gone in undercooked. And, and here's my reading of the situation, which is... We've probably gone into the season thinking full Krug will, will play majority of the games. Um, Antonio will play understudy. We've got Ings there in, in an emergency break glass sort of scenario. Um, but also Jared Bowen can play as a striker. What I think's actually happened, realistically, is neither Antonio or Ings are really capable of of filling in from the start of a game and being effective Premier League strikers and playing a full game of football. So that's a problem. And I do wonder if the manager's taking a look at Bowen up front and thinking he just doesn't... It, do, it doesn't work for him. I'm not saying it didn't work for David Moyes. And I know there's a lot of us saying, well, hold on, you know, we're just seeing Moyes 2.0 or, or the paella David Moyes, by David Moyes with a suntan, all that type of thing. I do think there are differences. There definitely are differences. And, and we are being asked to play in a slightly different way. And I'm not sure... It suits everybody in, in the same way. And I think Bowen, a striker, would be one of those. And that fits in with what, what we said at the start, which is he likes a big lump up front. He likes a physical presence. So I think we're looking at it now and thinking, actually, we've, we've made an error. We've made an error in the transfer window. Whoever's error that is, it doesn't particularly matter. But it doesn't help. We might... It's not, it's not, I don't want to sit here and particularly insult Ipswich Town, but they might, at the end of the season, be the worst team in the Premier League, right? They might. It's not, it's not unreasonable to suggest that. So we might get a little bit lucky that we're playing them. But we need to get this striker situation sorted. We really do. The thing that worries me with full Krug really is, um, is he going to have a pre-season? And what I mean by that is... <laughs> He's played in pre-season, he's played in internationals, but he'd have had so much time out that he'd almost like need a pre-season again in that sense. He's, he's, will, he, will he be ready? Even if he's fit, 
and uh, let's say not even fit. Let's say even if he's not injured by the time we get to Tottenham, can you really play him from the start? I don't know. He's, I guess they'll arrange some behind closed doors games or something like that. But there's so much pressure on him. This is the point. There's so much pressure on Fulcrook and um, it, not the ideal scenario for him to settle into. And I would suggest, as I said, at the start of the season, Max Kilman, big pressure on him, £40 million signing. But realistically, full Krug, £25 million or whatever he might have been, there should be people who take more focus than him. Kudus, well, I guess Kudus has for all the wrong reasons, as is Lucas Pakatar. There should be other players in there who take the focus off him, but he shouldn't be that important, but it appears that he actually is. And just West Ham are woefully bad at signing strikers. Now, the club have actually come out and said today that they won't be looking to sign any strikers in, in January, which I do think is interesting because we have started to get linked with them now. The association is is obvious, right? We would understand why that would be the case. But um, they've turned around and said, no, we need to, basically we need to make full Krug work, which I, I guess they do, really, don't they? Uh, a couple of other bits and pieces. Uh, Oli Scarls. Oli Scarls has signed a new long-term contract to West Ham. This is really, really good news. Now, if you're a patron, uh, Hammers Chat patron, if, if you're not, check out the link below, Hammers Chat. Uh, sorry, Sorry, patreon.com forward slash Hammers Chat. It's basically our third Hammers Chat channel and a great way that you guys can help support Hammers Chat and get loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of additional content. So we had Ricky Martin. No, not him. Not living La Vida Loca. We had Ricky Martin on our Patreon channel, who, of course, was the uh, former Academy director. And I spoke to him and he said to me that, and this is when Ollie Skulls was injured. He said, no, he said, I've got really, really, I've got a lot of faith that this guy's going to come back and he's going to come back strong. He was, when he started off, he was the, me mates, he's, I always get the name wrong. He played in a win against FC, FCSB, if you remember, uh, in the Conference League. He, he played as a wing back and he, he, was a, he was a skinny little kid that could cross the ball and, and deliver, deliver, deliver the ball on a sixpence, right? And he got, he got injured, basically. And not only did he get injured during that time, and this is something that Ricky Martin discussed with me, he had a, a, a big growth spurt. So he, he's gone. If you look at him now, he's a big guy. And he's gone in, in, in 18 months, pretty much. He's gone from being a, a, sk I mean, a skinny little, little kid to being a big man. And there's a lot... There's a, bit, a lot of growth, a lot of growth problems. I remember Steven Gerrard having exactly the same thing uh, happening to him. He, he basically shot up between, you know, whatever the ages of the age of 16 and, and 18. And you've got a similar thing that's happened with Oli Skiles. But that didn't help him recover from his injury. So it took a lot longer. He's now started to get back to form. Not only has he started to get back to form, he's now played in different positions for the under-21. So I was lucky enough when I went and saw um, West Ham play at Reading in the EFL Trophy uh, when it was end of August, um, he played in that, and, and I, I was I was taken aback by how by how big he was. But West Ham looked light in midfield. Uh, we really did, and, and that's understandable because we had players go out. Uh, Patrick Kelly's gone out on loan. Obviously, I know Freddie Potts wasn't in the under 21s last season, but Freddie Potts is out at Portsmouth, and um, and there's a lot a lot of players who've gone out on loan, and rightly so to get experience. So I very much felt like Lewis Orford was holding the fort in the middle on his own. As as a, a senior player, and Orford himself is only eighteen in, in the under twenty ones, but it did feel like everybody else was was sort of very underage, there, so to speak. Um, and there were a couple of times where where Skiles came in, just came in to help out in midfield and give a bit of a physical presence. Uh, since then, he's he's actually played a couple of times in central midfield, and I think he's played at least once in attacking midfield as well. And he's looked really, really good. So him signing a new deal is. Is excellent, and I think West Ham have done. We'll discuss it another time. I think West Ham have done really well by the. I think it was an issue for us before not being able to get these players signed down to um, long-term contracts, and, and we have clearly done much, much better at it. And uh, he's just the latest in a, in a long line there. Um, Skulls. I, I probably should. Yes, probably should give an update on the um, on the Mohamed Kudus one. It, look, the club, as expected yesterday, really played it down, said it was exaggerated, said they'd, said they'd made up. Uh, they'd, and you know what? Look, that's great. I would expect them to say that. And, and like I said yesterday, this stuff, I think, happens all the time in every dressing room. I would imagine every time, every time somebody, a team is losing, and then they go in for half-time and a the manager gives a rollicking, 
I bet both the manager and the players blame each other. Where, where were you? Where were you for that goal? Why, why weren't you marking him? You said that we weren't doing this in training. You weren't doing it. And I, and I bet sometimes there's just people finger pointing, kicking boots at each other, banging, banging the lockers or whatever they're doing. It's, it's a load of... Comp Adrenaline's running high. It's a load of competitive people in a dressing room. I'd imagine it happens all the time. So I think it's a case of nothing to see here. And I do believe, I hope, I'm hoping that's the case. It was, it was, it was the fact that some, someone in the dressing room had, had, had spilled. It's, it's not the done thing, is it? What goes on the mile stays on the mile. And someone within the dressing room had spilt the beans there, which did lead me to suspect, and, and still does, that someone does have it in for Lopetegui. I don't want to, I'm not going to put out in the title of this video because I don't particularly want to overly labour the points. I just want us to win uh, against Ipswich. But yeah, it, it's still a concern. It's still a concern for me. I've got, I've got my ideas. That, that much is, uh, is for sure. But I, I do hope, I, in many respects, I do hope that actually it's a bit of a clear the air and maybe some of the things that weren't being said before have been said. And uh, just to go back to, to what I said at the start about Fulkrug, maybe, just maybe, the the airing of opinions, the... Um, the the, cl the, cleanse, the cleansing, if you want, the cleansing process as could result in a frank exchange of opinions, which obviously happened. And possibly a situation whereby Lobotegi might look to play uh, Kudus in some approach in his best position. That that would be really, really good. He's got an opportunity to do so as well. And I think from uh, Kudus's point of view, he probably has the opportunity to to prove himself right. And to prove, you know, whatever, prove his doubt as wrong, prove himself right. He's not been great at the start of this season, truth be known. He has been played out of position, yes. Um, but nonetheless, he probably is still slightly better than that anyway. So I'm, I'm hoping good can come out of bad in this situation anyway. Uh, that being said, there's no glossing over the fact that our, our star striker, the, the one guy that the, the, the pivot... In fact, if, it's a, if the defensive midfielders are a double pivot, what do you call the actual pivot, which is, which is the striker? Is he no longer, the striker's no longer a pivot. Um, so whatever. The, the pivotal person, let's put it that way, um, to West Ham's tactics is missing. There's there's no way of sugarcoating that. West Ham have got to find a way through and hopefully get him fit and ready for the Tottenham game.